Joining me is John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government and Head of the Mies Legal Center at the Heritage Foundation. John, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Kate. Good to be with you. So I do want to discuss the legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but this being Washington, D.C., people did move very quickly away from mourning the late justice to discussing what's next. So first off, we're obviously close to the next election. Is there anything in the Constitution or in precedent that makes it problematic for the President and the Senate to confirm a new Supreme Court justice before the election? No, there's nothing in the Constitution uh, about that. The Constitution basically says that the President nominates, the Senate gives its advice and consent, although they can decide to withhold their advice and consent. And then once somebody is confirmed, the President appoints them. It's a three-step process. And that's all it says. Now, you know, there are, people are citing precedents of what we did in 2016 and what we're doing now and in other uh, confirmation uh, fights. Uh, but, and, and there are an awful lot of senators on both sides of the political aisle that I believe are eating the words that they said in 2016. But there is certainly no constitutional impediment or Senate rule or precedent uh, that would prevent the president from getting his nominee confirmed if the Senate. Uh, decides to confirm that nominee. Okay, so on a practical level, you've watched a lot of Supreme Court confirmations. What actually needs to be part of the process and how short could this process actually be? Well, the, the process has lengthened over time in part uh, because there are courtesy calls that the nominees uh, make on senators and the FBI does more extensive background. Uh, uh, checks and provides reports uh, to the senators, but the process can go very quickly. Uh, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was confirmed, I think it was something like 96 to 3. These were very different times. Uh, Anthony Scalia was confirmed, I think it was 98 or 99 to nothing. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was confirmed in, in six weeks. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, I looked this up, uh, was confirmed in 33 days. And in fact, there had been there is um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, nominated one justice, James Byrne, who was confirmed the day he was nominated. Uh, his next nominee, uh, Harold Burton, uh, he struggled. I mean, it took a whole day uh, from the time he was nominated <laughs> until he was uh, until he was confirmed. Uh, so that was a different time, and things are more contentious. But there, it, it can happen very quickly. So really, it sounds like the only thing that's absolutely essential is um, the Senate vote. It sounds like the courtesy calls and all that, maybe it would be unwise to skip them, but it sounds like that could be done. Yes, that's right. I mean, he could, he could nom the president could nominate somebody this week and the Senate could, Senate Judiciary Committee could hold a hearing uh, next week. I think the only procedural rule that I am aware of is, you know, and I suppose this could even be waived. The Senate Judiciary Committee typically schedules a meeting for a vote a week after having uh, its hearing. As a matter of course, if the minority party uh, requests an additional week before a vote, that is just granted. Uh, so, you know, there should be a vote within two weeks after the hearing concludes for the nominee. And then it goes to the Senate floor where it could be fast tracked. So President Trump has said he intends to pick a female justice. Uh, he's mentioned two women contenders by name, Amy, sorry, Amy Coney Barrett and Barbara Lagoa. So let's start with Barrett. What do we know about her? What do we know about her judicial philosophy? Well, we know a lot more about Amy Coney Barrett than we know about Barbara Lagoa. Uh, so Amy Coney Barrett, an exceptionally uh, bright, uh, bright woman, not that Barbara Lagoa isn't. Uh, so. Uh, graduated from Notre Dame Law School, uh, clerk for Judge Lawrence Silberman of the D.C. Circuit, and then uh, Antonine Scalia uh, on the Supreme Court. Spent a brief time in private practice, worked on the Bush for, for the Republicans in the Bush v. Gore dispute, and then spent most of her time in academia and most of that time at University of Notre Dame Law School. I mention that because she wrote, she, she published in many prestigious law reviews around the country on a whole host of issues that judges deal with and that conserv the conservative legal community cares about. She wrote a lot about originalism. She wrote about a, a lot about textualism. She wrote a lot about how judges ought to approach 
precedent and when they should adhere or depart uh, from precedent. She was quizzed on all of those things uh, and, of course, her Catholic faith uh, during her confirmation hearing, most memorably, Senator Dianne Feinstein from California, talking to her about Roe versus Wade, uh, said the dogma lived loudly uh, in her, and she held up with tremendous grace and poise uh, under fire. I think that Senator Feinstein probably regretted at the end of that hearing having asked her that question. And since she's been on the court, which was in 2017, she's written over 100 uh, opinions, both majority opinions, dissents, and concurrences, and has shown that she is uh, a committed textualist and a committed originalist. She said during her confirmation hearings, for instance, that she would set aside her personal beliefs and her faith to rule according to the law, certainly as a devout Catholic, which I believe she is. Uh, I don't know this for a fact, but I would suspect that maybe she does not like the death penalty. Uh, and, and on a personal uh, basis, yet she has joined uh, opinions that have uh, upheld, uh, you know, capital sentences. Uh, I, as far as I know, she hasn't ruled in any cases involving abortion. Uh, and, you know, my guess is the nominee, whoever she is, since we know it's going to be a she, uh, will follow what Ruth Bader Ginsburg did during her confirmation hearing and to say that it would be inappropriate for her to offer any hints or suggestions about how she might rule in a case that like, would be likely to come before the court. As to Barbara Lagoa, uh, people I know who know her like her a lot. Uh, she went to, she's Cuban American. Uh, she went to Columbia, Columbia Law School and private practice for a little while. She did pro bono work for the Miami family of Elian uh, Gonzalez. Uh, she was an assistant US attorney, federal prosecutor in Miami for uh, a few years. She, been a judge for, for quite a long period of time. She was appointed to an intermediate appellate court in Florida by Governor Jeb Bush in 2006. She served on that intermediate appellate court until January 2019 when Governor Ron DeSantis named her as the first Cuban American to the Florida Supreme Court. She did not stay long on the Florida Supreme Court uh, because President Trump plucked her off of that court uh, and nominated her uh, to the 11th Circuit, where she actually was confirmed quite handily. I think the vote was 80 to, to 15, but she's only been on that court since December uh, of, of 2019. She hasn't issued rulings in any significant number of cases, although recently she did join an en banc majority. It was a six to four ruling upholding uh, Florida's felon voting law. Uh, which required uh, a felons to serve their entire sentence, including paying all fines and restitutions before uh, they're eligible to have their voting rights restored. Uh, she joined the majority opinion that was written by Chief Judge Bill Pryor of the 11th Circuit. And one thing which I, I took great heart in, so Judge Pryor not only wrote the majority opinion, he wrote a one-page concurring opinion that was quite bold, in which he said, you know, the role of a judge is not to be on, quote unquote, the right side of history. The role of a judge is to follow the law, uh, be a good judge, whether it is popular or not, uh, and, you know, stand on, on adherence to the law uh, and the strength of one's convictions and not bend to the popular whims of the day. One other judge joined that concurrence, Judge Barbara Lagoa. Interesting. So, of course, the most recent confirmation hearing was Brett Kavanaugh's, and that was, to put it mildly, very ugly and divisive. Do you think conservatives learned lessons from the confirmation hearings of Kavanaugh? Do you think the left learned lessons? And how do you think that the Kavanaugh hearing or its shadow could affect this upcoming confirmation process? So I have a variety of answers uh, to that. I, I'm not sure the right learned much because these were lessons they had already learned through the Robert Bork and Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings, uh, which also involved, uh, certainly in the case of Thomas and Kavanaugh, uh, the politics of character destruction. Uh, so, you know, these vacancies don't come up very often. There are only nine of these justices. The, the Supreme Court considers all sorts of issues uh, statutory cases, important constitutional cases that define our rights, separation of powers, uh, et cetera. Indeed, the court takes on a lot of issues that I personally think they 
shouldn't take on and should leave to the democratic process. But because they take on these hot button uh, issues, senators want to know the personal beliefs of the, they want to get guarantees as to how these uh, uh, judges or nominees are going to rule in individual cases. And they get frustrated when they don't get answers uh, that they uh, that they want to hear, and 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 sometimes they reach out for you know more personal attacks in order to try to damage or defeat a nominee. You know this is going to be tough. I I don't think that it will be very credible to accuse either Barbara Lagoa or Amy Coney Barrett, if, if one of them is the nominee, of having attempted to rape somebody uh, in college. Uh, as said, which was the allegation against Brett Kavanaugh. I think that both of these women, they're charming and, and quite poised. We've been through a confirmation process recently. I think the Democrats are, are going to have to think very long and hard about how they attack these nominees, um, because if they're viewed as having overplayed their hand, uh, that could have an effect on how the electorates and undecided the electorate and how undecided voters view them. It will be particularly interesting, I believe, to watch how vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris, who is on the Senate Judiciary Committee, approaches this hearing. So you brought up the nine justices, which, you know, in most of our lifetimes, that's been the status quo. But what is the history of how many justices there have been in the Supreme Court? Have there been court packing attempts? And the reason I ask this, of course, is because representatives Joe Kennedy and Jerry Nadler, who's chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, both tweeted over the weekend comments that indicated that they think the Democrats should add more Supreme Court justices if a Trump nominee gets through. So is this a viable proposition and how does it fit into the larger picture? So let me go over the history of that and then I'll tell you whether I think it's a viable proposition. Uh, there is nothing in the Constitution. It just says that there shall be a Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress may establish. The number of Supreme Court justices is established by statute, and it has changed over time, although there have been nine justices for a long time. There was one serious attempt uh, in our nation's history to try to pack the court. So President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was very frustrated that a, a majority on the Supreme Court were issuing rulings, striking down large portions of his New Deal. He didn't like this. So he proposed a plan to basically pack the court. They were, the number of the justices were elderly. That basically said that he would get to name another justice for every justice who was over 70. That did not happen. It did not happen for a couple of reasons. One is he could not get enough Democratic support. They controlled the Senate at that time, fairly substantial majority. He couldn't get enough of the Democratic senators to go along with that plan. One of the reasons why he couldn't garner that kind of support, and this has been referred to historically as the switch in time that saved nine, is that after uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt put forth his court packing plan, one of the justices, I think it was Justice Owen Roberts, started changing his votes and started voting with the, you know, what had been the four dissenters to uphold large portions of the New Deal. Uh, and, you know, once Justice Roberts changed his vote and the New Deal was being upheld and not being struck down, I think some of the air went out of that balloon in terms of that effort to pack the court. Now, I think it is likely that if the Democrats uh, uh, keep the House and take control of the Senate and win the presidency, that they will pack the court, not just the Supreme Court, by the way. They'll probably add additional slots to the lower federal courts of appeals and additional district court judges, too. Uh, the last time that happened on any kind of a broad basis, not the Supreme Court, but lower courts, uh, was under Jimmy Carter. Um, and the reason, and, and, I, and I, I, so I think it's highly likely that they, that they may do it anyway. But certainly if President Trump pushes through a nominee uh, and he loses and the Senate is retaken by the Democrats, I think it's a virtual certainty that they will pack the court. The biggest impediment to them at the moment is that while the filibuster 
has been done away with, nuked is the, is the phrase that was used. The nuclear option was used to do away with the filibuster for nominations. The filibuster still lives uh, for legislation. And again, you'd have to pass a statute to change the number of justices on the court. But I think the Senate has, Democrats have already made it quite clear that they are fully prepared to go nuclear on the legislative filibuster too. And if they do that, all they need is for the House to pass something, 51 senators uh, to pass it to, and for a president to sign it. So to change tack, many conservatives have been frustrated with the recent decisions by Chief Justice John Roberts. Justice Neil Gorsuch also disappointed some conservatives with his decision in a recent ruling on Title VII in gender identity. Um, we also have Republican Senator Josh Hawley proposing that it's time for a litmus test on abortion for judicial candidates. So do you think conservatives need to vet Supreme Court nominees any differently than they did in the past, or how should conservatives approach this? Well, it, it, it is certainly true that there have been uh, rulings, uh, obviously the Bostock case, which you alluded to, that was written by, by Neil Gorsuch, several cases, the, the two Obamacare cases, the, the DACA case, uh, the citizenship question on the census, uh, the, you know, the June medical, the abortion case, where Chief Justice Roberts- John, you're just putting me in a bad mood at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this. Look, even your friends, even people whom you like and admire, who will rule the way you like 90 plus percent of the time are occasionally going to, to disappoint you. I mean, even Antonin Scalia, and no conservative would, would say that Antonin Scalia was anything other than a fantastic justice, joined an opinion that held that burning an American flag was protected speech under the First Amendment. And he wrote an opinion called Employment Division versus Smith that people of faith believe really watered down the free exercise clause of the Constitution. So even great justices whom you like and admire will occasionally disappoint you. These are independent-minded uh, men and women. And you look to see whether they are you know, issuing opinions with fidelity, even if you think they got it wrong, or whether they are really tacking to the left, which many Republican appointees, John Paul Stevens, David Souter, uh, certainly Earl Warren and, and, and William Brennan, have done. Now, I understand that frustration and I understand the desire of some to say, the vetting process has not worked well, we need to have a litmus test. I am not a fan of litmus tests for a variety of reasons. One uh, is I think that judges take an oath that they are not going to prejudge cases until they are presented with a case and consider the arguments uh, of the lawyers and any amicus curiae that weigh in on an issue. And I think that that is something that judges should take very, very seriously. The other thing is, is that Josh Hawley said, well, I want to have a litmus test on Roe versus Wade. And I want it to be for, you know, anybody, anybody has to have said before they were nominated what their views were. Well, if you went with that, then there are some justices like David Souter who probably get through. And there are other justices like Clarence Thomas, who was asked about this in his confirmation hearing. He said, look, I focused on other issues. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about Roe versus Wade, who do not get through. And so far as I'm concerned, any rule that would keep Clarence Thomas off of the Supreme Court is a bad rule. All right, let's switch to Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy. You know, she served nearly 30 years on the Supreme Court and before that obviously had a long career as a lawyer. How will she be remembered in the legal world? Well, she was a, a giant in the legal world in, in a way that actually very, very few lawyers uh, uh, can reach. So she did, she is the equivalent for women's rights that Thurgood Marshall was in terms of the rights uh, for, for African American. I mean, you know, she graduated from uh, uh, well, Columbia Law School. She was at Harvard for three years and then she transferred to Columbia because her husband would, had gotten a job in New York and finished tied for first in her class when she was at Harvard. I think she was the first woman on the Harvard uh, Law Review. You know, she struggled to get a job because she was 
uh, was a woman. She became a professor. Uh, and then she started in 1972, the American Civil Liberty Union's uh, Women's Rights Project. And she mapped out a strategy, a very successful one, to advance women's rights. She argued six seminal cases, winning five of them before the US uh, Supreme Court and, and lots of cases in the lower uh, in the lower court. So in terms of advancing women's rights, she is, is clearly uh, a legend and deservedly so. She then served uh, with distinction for a number of years in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and 27 years on the Supreme Court where she was certainly a liberal uh, icon. So while she certainly left her mark as a judge on the DC Circuit and a justice on the Supreme Court, where she really left her mark, was as, uh, as a lawyer. And to show how much respect she had uh, in the legal community and how different times were, even though she had started this ACLU women's project and in, you know, where a lot of Republicans did not like the positions that she advocated for, I think she was confirmed something like 96 to three. And on the flip side, Anthony and Scalia was confirmed. It was either 98 or 99 to nothing. Uh, but those times are long gone now. So speaking of those times, in your op-ed for the Daily Signal with Elizabeth Slattery, you guys talked a lot about what great friends she and Scalia were. And it really does seem to be the sort of friendship that is a little baffling in 2020 and also, sadly, seems to be going out of vogue in Washington, D.C. So why were these two such pals? I think they had, they knew that the important impact that they had had on the law. They served together on the D.C circuit before they uh, were uh, uh, justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, I think they admired each other's writing abilities and legal acumen, and they shared a lot of common interests. Most prominently, I suppose, that everyone knows about is they both loved the opera. And actually, I love the opera too. And I would see them uh, at the opera together. They were in operas on the Washington National Opera. Uh, on uh, on occasions, uh, and you know they they obviously enjoyed each other's time. I I, I remember speaking, not with Justice Scalia, but with Mrs. Scalia, Maureen Scalia, and she would just wax rhapsodic about what wonderful people Ruth and Marty Ginsburg uh, were. And at one point, I remember the two of them were being interviewed uh, and were asked about this. This friendship, which many, many people consider very bizarre. And, uh, and Justice Scalia looked at her and said, other than her legal opinions, what's not to like? Uh, and, you know, they, and they fortunately were able to have respect and admiration for each other. Clearly, they disagreed without being disagreeable and, and could put aside their political uh, and, and legal uh, differences to forge this, this this great friendship, and, and you are right, those, those sorts of relationships are now going the way of the dinosaur. So last question. We are seeing a ton of interest in the Supreme Court nomination, and in recent years, interest seems to have only grown. You know, um, a lot of donations flow into both sides, and while, you know, that's great for you, you're head of a legal center, <laughs> do you think it's good for America that we care this much about who's on the Supreme Court? Is this what the founders had in mind? Well, I think the reason it's not great for America is also the reasons why the founders would have been befuddled, which is the Supreme Court, by expanding uh, areas of the Constitution, so just in my opinion, finding a right uh, of privacy, expanding the Commerce Clause so that they not only consider commerce that happens in between states, but they get into a lot of issues about things that happen, you know, totally within one state of, that have the most minor of economic impact. They've expanded things like the general welfare clause. Instead of saying that a law has to apply to the general welfare, it now applies to bridges to nowhere in Alaska. That's good enough to you know, pass the general welfare test. Because the Supreme Court has expanded the Constitution in this sort of way through living constitutionalism, the Supreme Court now gets involved in so many issues that the founders would have believed should have been left to the democrat democratic process. And because the court gets involved in all of those issues, the public comes to view them as super legislators. And if you view them as super legislators, then you kind of care about how they vote on the issue that you care about. Uh, and that's why these things become <laughs> blood, blood feuds. 
Well, John, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today. Good to be with you.